I want to tell you a, a short story about myself. When I was in high school, I remember that all those guys who used to do physics and mathematics who always believed that they were the toughest guys. So the saying was that if you are going to do mathematics and physics, you have to keep your hair shaggy. You, know, you don't have to comb your hair. And you also, when you are walking, you've got to walk with a, an academic angle. That's when you have to become a man. So I did that, I kept my hair shaggy, and I went home, and my mother saw me, and after she said, oh my goodness, you are going to embarrass me. Now she took me to the side, and she shaved all my hair. And I said, oh my goodness, so when I went to my college, and they asked me, what happened? I lost my being a maniac. So today, ladies and gentlemen, we have a real maniac right here with us. <laughs> going to tell us stories about his experiences under the water, over the water, and, and also on the water. He has a lot of experience, over 27 years here at NASA God. So please help me welcome our speaker today, Jim Feldman. <laughs> Greetings. Um, I've got at least an hour's worth of stuff, um, so hopefully people can stay Till one, we'll see. Um, when I told my daughters I was doing this maniac talk, they kind of wrote back and said, at least they got the title right. <laughs> when I started thinking about this, and when, when Charles asked me to do this, um, I said, okay, I can do the traditional talk where I talk about science, you know, why are the oceans important in environmental change, what are phytoplankton, and why do we care about them, and then, you know, why should NASA be involved with the oceans? And I said, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to talk about that again. Uh, and that's also not what I think the talk is supposed to be about. The way I understood it, I'm supposed to be imparting some wisdom that I've gathered over the many years that I've been doing this to people that are just starting out. Um, you know, how did I get involved in doing what I'm doing? Why do I do it? What excites me about it? What are the steps that I took to get here? So we can forget about this uh, unless people are really interested, and I've got it in the backup slides. So. To start off, um, like Bob Binshadler did last time, he started off with a picture that showed him in front of a glacier, which is what he does. Um, same thing happened with me. Many years ago, I was invited to give a lecture to the Nevada State Teachers Association in Las Vegas. And I'm thinking, OK, I'm an oceanographer. What could these people possibly care about what I do? And the person who was organizing it said, OK, you need to connect with the audience. You need to show them something about yourself that lets them relate to who you are and why you do what you do. So I went through old photo albums and stuff and <laughs> grabbed a bunch of pictures. And there seemed to be a common theme <laughs> among all the pictures. Every one of these tells a story. Unfortunately, I'm not going to go into them, especially this one. <laughs> That's a half a ton of calamari. It's a really cool story. But anyway, so as you can see, for most of my life, oceans and more importantly, Creatures in the oceans have kind of been important, near and dear to me. Um, and then I say, OK, how do I think back and say, what event, what person actually was the most important, the most responsible for me taking the path that I took? And it actually, if it weren't for a guy named Alan Banner getting eaten by a great white shark, I wouldn't be here today. Okay. Um, the shark ate him instead of you? The shark ate him, which is why I am doing what I do today. And I'll see if I can explain that. Um, I was an undergraduate in biological sciences, but I always knew that I wanted to do something with the oceans. But as an undergraduate, they didn't have too many courses in oceanography and marine science. So I conned the dean into letting me take graduate level courses in under, as an undergraduate. So three years of that, I graduated with a bachelor's, but I'd also done a graduate program. And I said, I don't want to go to grad school. It's stupid. I've just done it. And they wouldn't give me the master's because I had to apply the credit for the bachelor's. So I applied for the Peace Corps. And uh, I wanted to do something in the oceans. I didn't really care where I was. But they told me they didn't have any slots available. So this was now May. Uh, I was graduating in a couple of weeks. I was in a play of a production of Twelfth Night, all right, wearing the full velvet Renaissance regalia. I was in a phone booth. 
because someone told me during intermission that there was a phone call from the Peace Corps and they wanted to talk to me. Um, answered the phone, hello, is this Gene Feldman? Yeah, we've got a job for you. I said, really? Where? They said, Samoa. I had no idea where it was. And they didn't tell me why all of a sudden the job appeared. Um, it wasn't until many le years later um, that I found out that, well, actually it wasn't many, my mother still doesn't know, but <laughs> <laughs> when I got down there, I found out the reason there was an opening was that there was a Peace Corps marine biologist working in Samoa, which is this little bunch of islands right here, basically in the middle of the Pacific, you know, 2,000 miles to anything. The guy, Alan Banner, was down there doing the job that I eventually got to do. He was out fishing, spear fishing one Sunday. Uh, he was stupid. He tied the fish to a lanyard around his waist. He was swimming. And all they saw was a great white come and took him away. That's how I got the job. Anyway, so I went down there not knowing this until I got there. And I was involved in fisheries development. And one of the projects I was doing was sea turtle conservation. Um, Turtles are endangered species around the world because people like to eat the eggs and like to eat the adults. So um, turtles in Samoa come up on the beaches, they lay their eggs, and the Samoans would get the eggs and eat them. So we had a conservation program going. The problem was the turtles were hawksbill turtles, which are carnivores. So to feed them, you had to go out and catch fish to feed the turtles. So I would go out in something that looked like this, it's an 18-foot carved dugout canoe, about that thin on the bottom. And when you're out there, this is what it looks like. You are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a little boat that's probably leaking. Um, and the nearest land is like that. If you go another mile away, you see nothing. 2,000 miles to the southwest, New Zealand. 3,000, 4,000 miles to the northeast, the US. Okay, Not a lot of margin of error. <laughs> so anyway, we used to go out, we used to fish. And one of the things that I noticed was that we could always go someplace around the islands and catch fish. You'd go to another place that, to me, looked exactly the same. It was no different. Okay? But there were no fish there. So what's different about this part of the ocean as opposed to this part of the ocean? From a boat like this, you really have no idea. You can't see. So that was one of the questions that my three and a half years in the Peace Corps kept resonating with me. Why is one part of the ocean more productive than others? OK, I was there three and a half years, came back to the States, worked very briefly at a stained glass factory, which had nothing to do with what I wanted to do, and ended up on a tuna fishing boat called the Eliza M, uh, leaving out of Panama, fishing for tuna. OK, the way they do it, it's called a tuna persainer. Uh, you, can't, there's, you can't see it in this picture, but I always want to touch the screen instead of using this. There's, um, they had a helicopter on this boat. And what the helicopter would do was take, up, take off and fly ahead of the boat and look for tuna. And the way they would look for tuna, a couple of different ways. One, they would look for birds, which generally were associated with bait fish that were swimming around, under which there would be tuna feeding on the bait fish. The other way would be to look for porpoise. Okay? It, probably a lot of you may know that. There's a, there was a big issue about fishing on porpoise for tuna because of the, the mortality. Anyway, that was one of the things they would do. So the boat would go. They would see a school of fish. The boat would drop this net, which was about a half a mile to a mile long, maybe three, 400 feet deep, circle around the tuna school, close the net up, and then harvest the tuna out of the net. But the problem was, oh, I can use this. OK, so here's the boat. Here's the net. It's closed up. They call it a purse stain because the bottom of it closes up like a purse. You pull the strings. So you've got all this tuna, ah, nope, inside the net, but you've also got some porpoise. Okay. I was on the boat as a National Marine Fisheries Service observer. My job when we were fishing on porpoise was to stand up here and observe everything that happened recorded in a log so in case there were any problems, um, the fishery service and the Justice Department could take action if necessary. When we weren't fishing on porpoise, I was working on the deck with the fishermen, just you know, as they would normally do. But anyway, the, what would happen is you'd close the net up, and before they started pulling the tuna out of the net, 
they would do this process called backing down, which was they put the boat in reverse, go through the water. The water would push the end of the, the net here under the water. Okay? And the tuna had been fished on so much that they understood what was going to happen. And so as the, the net sank a little bit at the end, the tuna would just jump out. And it, I swear to God, they would line up at the end of the net waiting for us to back down, and then they would jump out. And then when all the tuna were out, they stopped the back down, and they would harvest the tuna. When, when the por well, sometimes the tuna would jump out, which was they because if they did it wrong or if the currents were wrong, the net would go too far down, and the tuna would follow the porpoise right out. So there was this fine balancing act of backing down and stopping, backing down and stopping. Um, anyway, very interesting process. As I said, we left out of Panama up here. We went out, uh, went out for about two days, fished a little bit here. Had to go back into Costa Rica because one of the cables broke and cut a guy in half. So we had to bring him into the hospital. Um, then we went down, went around the Galapagos Islands, were chased around the islands by an Ecuadorian gunboat, uh, decided to leave that area, and <laughs> didn't see much in the way of fish. So the captain had heard rumors over the radio that there were fish down in this little island called Sale Gomez near Easter Island. So we steamed for days from Galapagos down to Sale Gomez just looking for fish. And these things were burning twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a day in fuel. Now that will probably be about $100,000 a day in fuel. Saw nothing. The captain took off from the boat in his helicopter, went to the island, spit on the island, came back, landed the helicopter, and we started heading up back north. We went all the way back north, and we ended up filling the boat in about three weeks fishing in one little area off of Costa Rica here. Okay, so again, it goes back to the, the thing that I was thinking about in Samoa. Why was this part of the ocean more productive than this part of the ocean? What was different? Finished that job. That was three and a half months on a boat with one stop in Costa Rica because some guy got cut in half. I said, OK, I need to do something else. So I ended up in Seattle, and I was again working for National Marine Fishery Service. This time, we were doing ground fish surveys in the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, and since I worked for NOAA, we went out in NOAA boats. This is one of the big boats, and they had smaller boats. And then NOAA decided to privatize this operation, so they chartered commercial fishing boats to take their scientists out to do the, sur the surveys. And this was one of the ones that I was on, the Heidi J. Boats are not supposed to do that. <laughs> okay, that, that was me in the boat taking a picture of that. Um, it's a long story, but basically, tides up in Alaska are huge, and they weren't keeping an anchor watch very well. We went up on a rock, and we sat there, and the boat went over. Um, for those of you who have not been on a commercial fishing boat, this is a, a oh back. This is a um, a stern trawler. So there's a big net hung on a reel in the back, and what happens is. They pay this net out the back, and they've got these doors on the side here that sort of keep the net spread apart, and they drag it along the bottom. And it's a very indiscriminate way of fishing. It catches anything in its path. Um, so the net comes aboard. Fish are dumped on the deck. Uh, first thing you have to do, in this case, it was a whole bunch of spiny dogfish. Uh, that's me. Oh, back. That's me, by the way. Um, you make sure the net is disentangled from all the fish. And then what you do is you sort all the fish out by species and size and all that stuff. And then you spend an hour, two hours, depending on the size of the catch, doing all sorts of biological sampling, taking otoliths out of the head, taking gonads out, weighing, measuring, and all that. And as you can see, it's a pretty gory business. All right. The weather also is not great, particularly up in the Gulf of Alaska. All right. You're working 24 hours a day, seven days a week doing this stuff. Um, and they're doing trawl after trawl after trawl. So they put the net out, they bring it back in, you do all the sorting of the catch while the net is out again. So you've got to get all your work done before the net comes back and do it all over again. And when the weather is this bad, half the time the decks are completely awash with water. All right? Like this. So you don't have a lot of time in between sets or working on the fish to get out of your clothes, go inside, get a cup of coffee, and then come right back out again. 
So what I used to do, there were these two big sinks on the deck for washing things. I found that if I could curl up in one of the sinks, I could go to sleep in between the casts, waiting for the net to come up, and all the water in the world could come up on the deck and it wouldn't matter. <laughs> and it was really comfortable after a while. <laughs> anyway, so I got to thinking. You got a lot of time to think when you're doing that. This is 1978, 1979, 1980, and I'm thinking, okay, I like being an oceanographer. I like fisheries biology. I enjoy this stuff. But I only had a bachelor's degree, right? Uh, I had plenty of years of experience. I've been working for seven years now, but I didn't have the letters after my name to get the kind of jobs that I wanted to get. So I said, okay, I've done it enough. I like what I'm doing. Let me go back to school. Let me get the license to practice and get the jobs I want. And um, we'll see what happens. So that, this was 1980. I decided to go back to school. Around the same time, NASA launched the last in its fleet of Nimbus observatories, the Nimbus 7. This was an, an early precursor of the EOS concept of multiple instruments on one satellite to measure many, many different things all coming down together. And in my case, there was an instrument called the Coastal Zone Color Scanner, uh, this thing down here on the back, which was, here's a better picture of it. Um, <laughs> which was meant to measure the color of the ocean, okay? Now, okay, here we do some science. Most people think the ocean is blue, right? And that's true for most of it. But there are these things in the ocean called phytoplankton, which are microscopic plants, just like the plants on land have something called chlorophyll, which is a green molecule that captures sunlight to convert CO2 and water into oxygen and and sugar. So plants in the ocean, these phytoplankton, when they grow, they have phytoplankton. The more phytoplankton in the water, the greener the water. The less phytoplankton in the water, the bluer the water. Simple, right? So basically, all ocean color remote sensing is based on that premise. And the, the coastal zone color scanner and all instruments since then are basically nothing more than a light meter in space. What they do is they look at the light coming back from the Earth. Sunlight hits the earth, interacts with stuff either on the land or in the ocean. Its color is modified, and then that light comes back up through the atmosphere and is detected by whatever the instrument is. And for those of you that have cameras with light meters in them, when you point it at something bright, the needle goes like this. If you point it at something dark, the needle goes down. So that's basically what these things do, but in different parts of the spectrum. So green, blue, yellow, red. Okay, so we measure how bright it is in the different parts of the spectrum. And this is a little demonstration that I do when I go to, to schools. I'm not going to do it here because I probably spill it on myself. Take, take some water, clear water, and I pretend that this is phytoplankton. So if I put one drop in here, that's one part per thousand. It gives it a certain color. If I put two drops in, you see that it gets a little greener. And then if I put a whole bunch of them in here, and I simulate a phytoplankton bloom, it's really green. So that's the premise for all ocean color remote sensing. All right. So 1978, Nimbus 7 was launched. The Coastal Zone Color Scanner, or CCCS, was on board. Great instrument, great mission, but it had some limitations. One of the limitations was this is at a time when NASA was not worried about taking risk. They would do experimental missions. They didn't know that it would work. They tried things out. So this was an experimental proof of concept mission. It was not meant to be operational. Um, problem was, there were a lot of instruments on board. And back then, they actually had a real little tape recorder that would have to share information with all the other ones. So they couldn't get all the data that the instrument collected. The other thing, back in 1978, nobody cared about global oceans. Global science was not something that people thought about. It was the coasts. People were environmentally conscious. Okay, we were worried about what was happening near at home. So this thing was meant mostly to cover the coastal ocean. Um, the other thing was back then computers were just in their infancy. And a lot of data was coming down. So the system as it was designed was only designed to process about 10% of all the data that was collected okay, by design. In fact, it actually only processed initially 
less than 2% of the data. So there's a lot of data collected that was never looked at. Um, this was one of the problems. Who decides where you collect data? Okay, you got an instrument on a satellite. It can only look at certain places. Who decides? There were a select few, a science team. These people controlled everything. And finally, getting access to the data was really, really hard. You basically had to know somebody to get it. All right, so I said, ah, oh, I've got an idea. I'm in grad school and I'm curious as to why some parts of the ocean are more productive than others. I figure there's got to be some relationship between ocean color, phytoplankton, and fish. Eh, makes sense. NASA's got a satellite that's flying around, not being that heavily utilized. Let me see if I can propose to NASA to let them pay for me to go to grad school and uh, do research. So this was my hypothesis. This was the question that I wanted to ask to understand how the coastal, how the ocean in the eastern equatorial Pacific um, changed and what the biological productivity was like and what it was related to. Lo and behold, NASA said, sure, sounds good, we'll do it. I was now on the inside. I'd crossed over. <laughs> from, this is important. What I was now able to do was to request places to be covered. So if you look at this, this is what was happening normally. That's the kind of coverage that you would get for an entire month. And if you can see, the area that I was interested in was mostly this area here. Nothing. Okay? I started requesting that the Eastern Pacific be collected. Old data started showing up. Yeah, I felt pretty special. This is great. Um, my request started in September 1982, probably before some of you were born. <laughs> you may not remember, but my timing was really bad. Because the very week that my data started being collected was the week that, at the time, the mother of all El Ninos hit. All right? This is um, sea surface temperature off the coast of Peru. You can see right when my data started being collected, it rocketed up. That was the El Nino hitting the coast of South America. So here I am sitting on a data set that's being collected, basically showing what an El Nino is. But I had no idea what normal was. So I figured, eh, OK, it's 1982, 1983. They've been collecting data for four years. No problem. I'll go back, look at the data, and decide what normal is and compare it. It was not that easy. Okay? Um, the way it worked was the instrument would collect data on board. The data would come down, and they would do a very preliminary processing of the data just to say, OK, we've got something. The only record of that would be this piece of paper. That's the thing in the upper left there. They're called laser facts. In the basement of building 314 were file cabinets filled with these things. Okay? And along the side, there were times. All right? And what you see is you see cloud and you see black stuff. That's it. What they would do is somebody in the basement of building 314 um, would look at these things and say, oh, that looks interesting, and mark it in two-minute increments. They would then send a request off to this computer facility to take the raw data that was collected and process that two-minute scene. So it was a completely manual process. All right? So what I had to do to do my research was to go down to the basement, go through every single one of these damn things, Try to find the Galapagos on this. <laughs> All right? Just for, there they are, right there. All right? Those things. You get really good after a while of finding them. But, okay? So I did that. And I don't know how long it took me, but I went through every laser fax that had been collected from November 1978 through 1982 and started circling them and made lists like this that I would send, now that I'm in inside, Send lists to the people, please process the data for me. As a result, I started getting boxes and boxes of these things. For those of you who've never seen a mag tape, this is a mag tape. <laughs> All right? It's like an old you know, record player. Anyway, you could fit three files on here. So I go back to school, and all of a sudden, the people in the shipping department go, 
what the hell are you doing? <laughs> Literally, hundreds of boxes of these things started showing up on my door. I would, every three or four months, fill, I had a Volvo station wagon, fill the wagon with the boxes, drive down here, spend a week or two down at here and also at NOAA at night because people were using the computers during the day processing all these scenes. All right? So that took me about three years to do that work. But finally, I did it, wrote the dissertation. Uh-oh, there it is. And success. I got, a, I got a PhD, and I also got a couple of papers out of it. This was when I was still a grad student. I got the cover of science, which was kind of cool. Um, anyway, what I also did, I keep wanting to hit the thing. I took the same data, and I studied the Galapagos from space. I've never, I'd never been there. And noticed that during normal times, the western part of the Galapagos here was always productive, high chlorophyll concentrations. This was also where most of the breeding colonies of the seabirds and the seals would be. When El Nino hits, those colonies either shut down, vanish, or they die. Okay, so profound influences. The original idea was that when El Nino hits, everything dies, productivity decreases. But because I had the satellite data, what it showed was not only this is normal, but during that transition, the product, productive area was redistributed. It moved from the west to the east. But if I'm a bird and I'm living on this little tip of the island here and I've got a 25 kilometer radius that I can go out and find food, the fact that you've got all this stuff growing out here doesn't help me at all because it's too far for me to go. So what I was able to do was to show that there's a progression of events of the biological response of the ocean to an El Nino that first redistributes the productivity, but then ultimately it decreases. So this answered that first question that I had. You know, why are some parts of the ocean more productive around islands and stuff? So yeah, I was on a good, I was on a roll here. Then I went a little bit further. I started compositing images. So instead of just one little image, I would put bunches of them together, composite them over space and time, and build up these pictures of the entire region. So here's the Galapagos out here. This is about 1,000 kilometers. And this is El Nino. This is La Nina. Huge difference in the productivity of those areas. No one had ever done this before. Okay, this was still in its infancy. So what it demonstrated was we could take these ocean color observations and get a handle on what's happening over a very, very large scale, much more than you could possibly do with a ship. I got to a crossroads. I was at a point now, I'd, I'd gotten my degree, I had published a couple of papers, uh, I began to get a reputation for doing science, and I said, okay, what do I want to do now that I've got this? And I had a choice. I could either continue to do my science that I cared about and publish papers and you know all that kind of stuff, or having learned all the lessons that I'd learned on how difficult it was to go through this process to enable anything to happen, I said, maybe I want to do that. Maybe I want to help other people to do that, their science better than they could do it currently. That way, the impact that I might have on the scientific world would be even better than just me doing it myself. And that was a choice I made. And it was, very, it was, it was not an easy choice because what it basically said was, I'm going to put my science, my interests second. I'm going to try and focus on collaborating with others to do science. And that's the choice I made. And um, as a result of that, a number of people here at Goddard, uh, Wayne Assayas, Chuck McLean, others, formed a proposal to NASA headquarters to basically process all the useful CCCS data that had been collected this was 1985, up to that point. The instrument was still running. And process it in a consistent manner within three years and make that data available. So that was the proposal. NASA headquarters agreed. And the rationale was, was this. And there, there were a lot of reasons for it. Uh, the one that I want to focus on is this one. We said, the way things were being done was broken. The system was not working. You had to know somebody or be on the inside to get data. That was wrong. 
Okay, the data should be there and open for everybody. So we said, let's do this mission. Let's put out a really credible scientific data set that had never been available before. But also, let's prototype the kinds, ah, the kinds of things that we want to do if we ever get a chance to do it right. Okay, that's what all of us involved in that project uh, had to do. Let, let me say one thing before I go further. A lot of what I'm saying is me oriented. This is my story. But I could not have done any of the stuff that I'm doing or that I'll show you that I've done without an incredible team of people. Okay? This is you know, a testament to an incredible bunch of people over the last 30 years that have worked together, slaved together, uh, have been dedicated to this concept. And so everything that I'm saying, anything that I'm showing here is not my work. It's the work of this team that I've had the privilege of working with. So I just want to get that out of the way so don't think that I'm any great shakes here. All right, so, but there was a problem. So we now had seven years of data, all of it back in those file cabinets because that had not changed. So what we did was a bunch of us plus the folks down in 314 went through all the laser facts, every single one that had been collected from 78 to 1985 at that point, and scheduled all the data for processing. <laughs> okay, you guys have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark, the last scene? I kid you not, that is what it was like. There was a warehouse over, I think it was in Lanham, that was 30 feet tall, multiple racks of nothing but boxes of tapes containing all the data that had been processed. Okay? 32,000 of these things. What was our density? Was it 1,600 BPM? Yep. 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 They could hold three files. Anyway, so this is the system we had. A couple of microvaxes. Anybody know microvaxes? A tape, yeah. <laughs> A tape drive. This was the big one. Our disk storage. We had six of the biggest disk drives you could buy at the time. I mean, they're huge, like this, right? Total of three gigabytes. $150,000 just for disk drives, for three gigabytes. 32 gigabytes, right? 40 bucks. We've come a long way. <laughs> Anyway, we spent three, we spent 18 months, night and day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, transcribing tapes, reading those tapes in on a tape drive, writing them to optical disk. All right? Um, this is the head of the tape drive that did it. <laughs> I kid you not, the the day that the last tape was read, I swear to God, the last tape was read, okay, on this very head, one of those tape drives bearings broke. And it let out this banshee wail that filled the computer room. It, I was up there when we were doing it, and the last tape spooled, finished, rewound, and Wah! it was like that. It was incredible. Anyway, so what we did was we said, okay, we can't put all of it on disk, so we, we got these optical disks, which were brand new. We had the second jukebox in the country. Um, each one of these guys, this is, <laughs> they were called worm drives. W write once, read many. Okay, they're optical, it's a laser. Okay, and there's a little shutter here, okay? Um, interesting story, sidelight, I've got time, good. Um, at the time, this is 1988, 1989, our group was the largest customer for these Sony optical discs in the world. <laughs> Our little group, OK? Um, I was over in Japan for a meeting of JGOFs, which is this other program. And Sony heard that I was coming to Japan. And they asked, would I please come and visit their factory where they make these things? <laughs> so, sure, great, right. So this guy picks me up, takes me off to the factory, and there are all these, leads me into this conference room. And there must be 30, 40 of their Sony's best engineers. Okay? They form a reception line. And I go down the line. <laughs> I, everyone's giving me cards, so I got a stack of cards like this. 
And we go into a conference room and it's just beautiful, nice tea and food. And so they start asking me questions. You know, how do we like the product? Is it good? You know, they're just picking my brain. How is it? And then everything's wonderful, fine, great, how do we use it? Then they get the question, any problems? And I said, by the way, yeah, we actually have one problem. And a hush. The <laughs> it was like the whole room froze. And they all kind of look at me. And problem is, and I, this one's actually broken, but see the shutter? Okay? When you put the thing in the jukebox, there's a little latch that goes down and this thing slides across. But you can see there's a little play here. Inside of this, there's a little plastic gear. What would happen is they would ship these 10 to a box. And by the time they got to us, they'd been beaten around and stuff like this. That little gear would slip a tooth. And it would not work right. And so I said, one of the problems we have is that maybe one out of 20 of the drives, um, the discs that we get don't work because the, the shutter doesn't work. And I said, what I have to do is unscrew the whole thing, take it apart, reset the, the gear, and then put it back together. And they're going, oh! You know, like, <laughs> it's amazing. They, they went crazy, like, oh my god. The very next box that we got had a little shutter, a little tape, little like a smiley face sticker. Okay, They were actually, I think, smiley faces, but I don't remember. They were little stickers, and they would just put them on there. That's what I'd suggested. They said, just tape it shut or something. And they listened, and never had a problem since then. It was great. But anyway, I, I digress. Um, so getting back to the thing about distribution. Okay, we said, we're making this data set. This is back in the late 80s. Okay? Internet was in its infancy. You couldn't ship data. You could just maybe send a text email to somebody via telemail or something. Um, remember that word, telemail? <laughs> Omnet? Anyway, so what we did was we, we came up with this concept of a distributed archive system. All right? And the guy sitting right over here, Norman Curring, came up with this distributed browse system where there was a video disk and every single file of these 65,000 was a frame was made that gave information about, here's the image, this is Florida, some basic information about it, and more importantly, the file name. We had about a dozen sites around the country that bought this little video disk system, and we gave them the complete reduced resolution digital archive on optical disk as well. There were 15 disks that would hold the complete global data set, plus this browse system that would let them instantly access any one of the files. So you could do a search for a certain geographic area, and it would spit out a list of files. Then you could go over to your disk drive, put the optical disk in, and pull them off. So it was the first distributed archive system. The full resolution data resided here and also at the NSSDC, which was here at Goddard. We would provide the high resolution data if people needed it. But people could work directly in their own place. So anyway, it really worked. It was great. Ultimately, we processed the entire world. Uh, it was a great success. And 1988, National Geographic was celebrating its centennial. And I'm not going to tell you. The land data here came from Jim Tucker. It's a vegetation index. CCCS didn't measure the land very well. So uh, at the bathroom of the Columbia Hilton, <laughs> <laughs> during the first EOS multidisciplinary meeting, Jim and I were in the bathroom, and we started talking. Both of us are a similar mindset in terms of just stop talking about it, just do it. So, we're hearing all these people talk about interdisciplinary that and multidisciplinary that, blah, 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 blah. We said, let's just do it. So what we did was we took the CCCS ocean color data and we took the corresponding land vegetation index and put them together to produce the first image of the global biosphere. Okay, just to show it can be done. What was really another interesting story. See the hole? Okay, so this is all, this is all the CCCS data that we had. But there was a hole here. I had to fight with the National Geographic editors. They said, can't you just fill the hole? <laughs> I swear. I met with the chairman, you know, Gil Grosvenor of the National Geographic, saying, please, fill the hole. 
And I said, no, there's, there's actually a message here. The message is, even though we have never had this kind of look of the world before, our knowledge is still incomplete. Having the whole there makes that point, that we still don't know what's going on here. They agreed. It was great. Anyway, so CZCS was a great success. Three, Led to CWIFs. Three, two, one, drop. And that is video from the F-18 chase aircraft. Okay. Basically, because of the success of that project that showed that you can do global ocean color from space, um, NASA headquarters and a bunch of folks here decided that we can do something called CWIS, Sea Viewing Wide Field Sensor. Um, everything about this mission was unique. It had never been done this way before. They put a bunch of crazy scientists in charge of a project instead of having you know, the engineering group or the flight projects group do it. Um, and as you probably know, CWIFS was an incredible success. It cost the U.S. taxpayer $42 million for a five-year mission. Okay, for any of you that are working on space, you know, projects, you know, multiply that what by a factor of 10, and you get what it costs to do business now. CWIFS cost the taxpayer at no cost because it was a um, a fixed fee contract, 42 million bucks. It was amazing. Every day, CWIFS collected global data like this, downlinked it twice a day. Uh, in addition to that, we had a network of ground stations around the world. Um, there were roughly about 132 of them around the world, including one in the Galapagos. Worked out a deal where the Charles Darwin Foundation would build a ground station to collect data of the Galapagos. Um, but getting back to the thing of if we had the opportunity to do it right, we would. Back in 1994, we launched the CWIS Project homepage. Okay, 90, I think we were the first NASA website. This was when the web was just beginning. So CWIS was one of the first. This was three years before CWIS launched. We already had, ah, back, no, nope. a browse facility online now that Norman wrote. Uh, we had a complete web page. What we did was run the mission as in simulated mode every day as if it were real, day in and day out, practicing. So that when that thing launched, ultimately in 1997, we hoped that the transition would be smooth, seamless, and the data would be available. Most missions, there's a long lag time between the thing going up and data coming out. Not so with CWIS. Oh, right. We launched in August of 1997. <laughs> I forgot. And we thought this was the mother of all El Ninos. This was even bigger. Okay? So, big difference though. This time, we had eyes in the sky watching the Earth. And lo and behold, the Earth, and we're actually able to watch it. This is what the ocean looked like roughly in the El Nino phase. The colors down here, purples and blues, are low chlorophyll concentration, low productivity. Greens and yellows, higher concentration. Okay, so if this is El Nino, in May of 1998, it flipped to La Nina, which is the reverse of El Nino. We witnessed the biggest phytoplankton bloom ever, right before our eyes. The entire equatorial Pacific, from the coast of South America all the way across, exploded. It went from a desert to a rainforest literally within a week. But because of sea whiffs, we were able to watch it. And ultimately, after 13 years, sea whiffs allowed us to do this. Um, you've probably all seen this image. It's all over the place. This time, we used Jim's Vegetation Index algorithm, but with CWIS data. So this is the first actual image of the global biosphere taken with a single sensor, calibrated the same way, and, you know, um, remember the, the thing I showed you earlier, the fishing boat, the tuna boat, Pacific? Okay. Remember how when we went down to Sally Gomez, there were no fish? Sally Gomez is right down here that purple spot, okay? 
We filled the boat up here, Costa Rica Dome. So the other answer to the question that I was looking, it's right there in front of our face. We didn't have this back then. This has revolutionized the way we understand how the ocean's biology responds to any environmental change. Because of the success of sea whiffs, um, a bunch of stuff happened. Um, you may have heard of this whole concept, missions to measurements. Um, that happened because every time NASA would launch a new spacecraft, somebody somewhere said, oh, we need to build a new data system because this has never been done before. You know, and you spend all this money, you reinvent the wheel, and you have a data system that doesn't kind of work. Um, you got on the learning curve. So basically what happened was headquarters decided that that was a flawed concept, a waste of money, a waste of talent. Why not take a group that has demonstrated expertise in a certain area and allow them to essentially reuse the software? So basically, the small group of us, actually it wasn't so small, at the time SeaWiffs launched, there were something like 45 people altogether working on SeaWiffs. Okay? Where we are, this is our, this is our group today. Uh, it's got many names, the Ocean Biology Processing Group, uh, part of the Ocean Ecology Lab. Anyway, today there's like half that number. But not only are we still doing historical data sets, okay, but we're actively in charge of these guys as well for all the oceans. So obviously we figured out a way of doing it very, very efficiently. Uh, one of the things that we do is take advantage of the web. Uh, again, I think our group, and I say group, pioneered what one can do with interacting and using the web to distribute data and information and share that. So there's a single source of information. This is the browser. If you go to this page and you go to the level one, level two browser, you get this thing. You get a map of the world. You get a little bunch of buttons up here that you can choose. So SeaWiffs, Modus Aqua, Modus Terra, Veers, OCTS, Maris, and CCCS. All right. So basically the record of data that we hold online now goes from 1978 through today. You can go in and in this particular case, I'm going to do what I would have done when I was doing my dissertation. Give me all the data that covers the Galapagos. Okay. I do that, I hit the button, and in three, four seconds later, I get this. 24,338 files have met that criteria. I hit the order button at the top, and within three minutes, my data starts showing up on, an FTP, on a, a website for me to download. This is directly related to the experience that I had in having to go through these things. Okay? We said never again. No one should ever have to have that kind of trouble to do science with data that was collected, paid for by taxpayers. Let's make it as easy as possible. So this has been incredibly successful. In addition, there's a feature on the website that allows you to go in and choose a part of the world that you want, put a subscription in, and every time a data file comes in, it's checked against this. The data is processed, extracted, and either emailed to you or put on a site for you to download. Um, you notice I selected the Galapagos. And this is the kind of stuff one would get if one did this. And one, being me, did this. Um, a couple years ago, I was invited by the Charles Darwin Foundation to actually go to the Galapagos to, for two things. One is to participate in a international scientific colloquium celebrating the, what was it, 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth, the 150th anniversary of the, the publication of The Origin Species, the 50th anniversary of the foundation you know, creation. So I got to go to the Galapagos. But I also went on an expedition with the Dow Darwin Foundation. And so what I did was, before I left, I set up this little mechanism to go ahead and pull these images out every single day so that while we're at sea, I'm on a boat again. Um, <laughs> I would get those things. So we could, in real time, relate the conditions that we were actually measuring on the surface to something that the satellite was seeing overhead. And it was, it was pretty amazing. So 14 of my closest friends and I were on this boat for a week. 
And because I was with the Darwin Foundation researchers, we got to go places that most of the tourists aren't allowed because 98% of the Galapagos are a national park. So you can't go certain places. So I was very, very fortunate. So I spent a week going around the islands, um, doing plankton sampling from a, a handheld net, diving with the guys. It was amazing. It was one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. And what was even more so was that I realized that when I was down there, it was literally 25 years from the time that I had first published a paper on the Galapagos, but had never been there. And I finally actually got to realize that dream of being there. Um, and what I'd like to leave you with is this. This is what CWIFs and MODIS and VIRS allow us to do now. Okay, I'm um, just going to let it play because I find this to be one of the most beautiful, inspiring, evocative movies that I've ever seen. This is the 10 year data set from CWIFs, animated, and vegetation on land as well. So, Jim, you have something to look at too. I'm just going to let it go around once. What I love about this is everybody that looks at it sees something different. You know, some people focus on a different geographic area or a different process or something. And every time I look at it, I see new things. But basically, um, this is sort of me getting up on my soapbox. We, NASA, study planets, OK? We study the chemistry, we study their physics, their geology, and everything. As far as I know, no other place out there has had that combination of factors that have allowed this to take place. You know, the, all the other planets are just an empty set, an empty stage. This is the only place that we know where the, the theater of life actually takes place. And the important thing is the Earth is changing, right? There's no question. No one's going to argue with me about that, I hope. We know it's going to change. Okay. What's important is how does the Earth's biology and its habitability respond to that environmental change? And what is the consequence for life as we know it on this planet? That's what we have to be concerned about. That's what we have to care about. That's what we have to plan for. Okay. Not debate whether or not the Earth is changing. That's stupid. That's a waste of time. But how is this going to change in the future? And what does that mean for life as we know it? That's the message. And that's what having these kinds of observations from space allows us to do for the first time. And you know, it's been a long, strange trip for me to get here. But the fact that we can produce stuff like this and that people around the world have instant access to data sets like that says that when I came to that fork in the road and I took, took it, I think I made the right choice for me personally. Um, anyway, I'm going to stop there, and I made it within the hour. Um, so we'll take a few questions. Uh, Get out while you can. <laughs> questions, or comments. comments. Nothing. Oh, yeah, I'm about the hole you showed earlier. Why they disappear in the later data? Did you miss the early part about the Coastal Zone Color Scanner collection? Yeah. That was built from the Coastal Zone Color Scanner, which was intermittent in its coverage. So even after 65,000 scenes and seven and a half years of data, there were still parts of the ocean that were never even viewed once. And that was what the hole was. Okay. The Sea Whiffs was a uniform sampling every day over and over and over again, which is what you need to do the kinds of studies that, that everybody here does. That consistent, long-term, well-calibrated record. That's what's critical. Was that by accident? What was accident? No one looked, no one had put all the data on the globe and said, oh, there's a, a blind no. spot here. No. So it just, no one thought to look there, so no. nobody looked there. The very, last, uh, the very last month that CZCS operated, we tried to do a complete global coverage. Okay. The problem was there was a limited tape recorder storage. So you had to balance all this. And they literally had to kick the thing to keep it going. And 
if you look at the very last month, June of 1986, it's got the best coverage ever, but there are still places that were never covered. You, you mentioned uh, putting in the ground station at Tech I guess, I, I believe it was. Uh, how, how much of a, a, a barrier it was and is lack of ground stations to, to, to break down data? Um, the, the thing with CWIS was, um, again, it was designed in the early 90s, okay, and onboard storage was limited, unfortunately. So what they had to do, CWIS, the instrument collected data at one kilometer resolution, okay? Um, that's what the instrument actually collected. Then, in order to store the data on board, they had to subsample it to four kilometer resolution, and that's what was stored on board. But at the same time, it downlinked directly all the one kilometer bits. So if you had a ground station inside of the spacecraft, you could collect one kilometer data. It was just based on the limited storage capacity and the downlink scenario that we had. So with the 132 ground stations, of which like 80 something actually collected data, for the first several years of the mission, we had pretty much global one kilometer coverage from the ground stations. Part of the deal was if you were a CWIS ground station, you had to send the data back to us all of which went into that browser. Um, if we had to do it over again, or if you know, we'd known that CWIS was going to be delayed the four years before launch, we probably could have put more memory on board to allow it, but it also only had an S-band downlink, which at two megabits would not have been able to get it all down. So this is old stuff. That's that, you know, technology was old back then. You, you remember the thing, this thing, right? <laughs> so different ground stations got different. Yeah, you, they only saw the 10 or 15 minutes as it flew overhead. So, yeah, we all took it and then we merged it all together. That's what the MLAC is that people use. And there are many swaths where there's complete, but there are large places in, say, the Central Pacific where there's nothing. Um, we had one in New Zealand, in uh, Galapagos, Hawaii. I'm not sure Tahiti ever came up. I think they had some, a couple of samples. But we tried to strategically place ground stations. We didn't pay for them. This was people putting their own money up to collect the data. They did it because they wanted the data. Okay, uh, we'll take one more question. Does fishing industry today use CWIPS data operationally? Does what? Does fishing industry use the CWIPS data? Actually, yeah, the, that, that was an interesting thing. The reason it cost NASA only $42 million was it was a commercial partnership it was the first NASA data buy. So Orbital Sciences, who built the instrument and the spacecraft, said, ah, there's a potential market here. So they owned the commercial rights of the data. NASA owned the research and educational rights. So they created this fish finding company that would produce maps that would help fishermen who spend twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a day trying to find fish be more efficient. And people said, oh, you're going to kill all the fish in the sea. The point is, most fisheries are managed by a quota. Okay? So when a certain amount of fish are caught that the scientists say is a safe level, the fishery closes. So you have two ways of doing that. One, they can just go out there and just willy-nilly and spend a fortune and catch that amount of fish, which means the fish are very expensive because they burnt all this fuel to do it. Or they're more efficient, it costs less money to catch the same amount of fish, then they go somewhere else for a different fishery. So that was the, the concept. And they did, there are still commercial fish finding groups out there. We provide most, originally Orbital did their own processing of the data. We were so efficient that ultimately they relied on our data products and many companies around the world still pull the data off of our website to support their commercial operations. So, that's fine. Okay, on that note, uh, Jim brought oh, yeah, yeah. posters, posters. Here. So if you're interested, please grab one. Collector's items. Yeah. Collector's items. So for you, it's free anyway. And then next month, we're having Mian Shin coming, and in August, Claire Parkinson. So please, you know, stay out. We'll, we'll, we'll call you again. Okay? Let's, let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.